Hello everybody. This is Clemzy Clements. And I want to welcome every one of you to my platform this evening. And um, today we're going to be having another series you know of teaching. Uh, I'm, sta I'm starting a series today that is titled The God Who Lived the 99. And the first person to join me today is Wendell Watson. You're welcome on the platform. I'm glad to have you. Uh, let's see who else is going to join us tonight. And um, today will be part one of the the series I'm going to be doing. And um, once again, it is titled "The God Who Lived the 99." Sam, saying, Sam, you're welcome, sir. I'm glad to have you. So today. Um, I'm glad to be back. Samara Amika Fina, you're welcome. Uh, please, I want to uh, plead with every one of you to help me share the video and invite your friends. Copy the link and put on their inboxes. You know, share on your timelines and uh, let them come and listen to the teaching of tonight. Krista Bell Ihedika, you're welcome on my platform. I'm glad to have you. Okay. So, if you have shared the video already, the next thing you will, you will need to do is to look for a Bible. Get hold of a Bible. Uh, you could search the Internet Bible, log on to the Internet Bible, because we are going to be reading the scriptures today. And I, I pray that at the end of today's um, teaching, that somebody will learn something and somebody will be blessed. Father, we thank you for today. We ask that you teach us your word once again. Spirit of God. We are receptive to your voice tonight. Let not my voice be heard, but let only your voice be heard. And open the hearts of your people to understand the message. Thank you, awesome God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, Emeka Felix, you're welcome. Mrs. Olushola Fashogbe, you are welcome. So please um, invite your friends. Share the link. Let me quickly share the video also. Let me share the video. So I'm going to share the video now, and I believe that you will help me share the video also. Now, what did I say the topic? The topic is the God who lives the 99. The God who lives the 99. And if you, if you are a student of scriptures, you already know what I'm talking about. The God who lives the 99. Now, who is this God who lives the 99? And why should he leave the 99? And who are the 99? That's what we're going to be talking about today. The God who leaves the 99. Now, if you have been a Christian for some time, you would have known that the fact that we are Christians, that we are born again, has not really given us immunity to sin. Now, by that I mean we have not become robots automatically after we got born again. Mr. Richard, you're welcome. Thank you, Samara Fina. Thank you so much. Diamond Ranty, you're welcome. Now, if you have been a Christian, you would have realized that after we got born again, we did not automatically become robots such that we no longer make mistakes again, such that we no longer fall short again. Now, one of the things that I would have expected God to do was to make sure that after you are born again, you receive the Spirit of God, you automatically lose the ability to sin. But unfortunately, God didn't do that. When God came to save us, he didn't save our flesh. He only saved our spirit. Our spirit is saved and sanctified. Our spirit is born again. But our flesh was not changed. Nothing happened to our flesh when we got born again. Your color didn't change. Your hormones didn't change. 
your nerves and your blood vessels didn't change when you got born again. Everything about your case, the physical body, remained the same. Now, but your spirit man got born again. Now, but one would have thought that after we get born again, there should be no possibility for us to even make mistakes again. There should be no possibility for Christians or believers to fall short at all. But God didn't do it that way. God made it in such a way that even after you are born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, because you are still in this human body, you still make mistakes, you see fall shots. You still have weaknesses. But today I'm going to be showing you God's response to our weaknesses. I'm going to be showing you God's response when we fall, when we make mistakes as believers, when we fall short as believers, how does God respond to us? And I'm going to show you that the heart of God is far different from the heart of most Christians that I see today. Now, what do I mean by that? The intention and the desire of God is different from the desire of most believers. Now, why did I say that? Because when Christians fall short, when Christians are found with certain you know, weaknesses, or when Christians are found in certain sins, right? They are fellow Christians. They are fellow Christians who think that, oh, I didn't commit that sin that my brother is committing. Or I, I don't have that weakness that that brother has. Now, these ones who think that they don't have shortcomings, they don't have weaknesses, who think that they are perfect, their heart is not that that brother or that sister who is struggling with a particular shortcoming be strengthened. That is not their heart. Their heart is not that this one should be restored. That is not their heart. Now, their heart is that, oh, me, I'm righteous. You know, I, I'm not committing that sin. I'm holier than thou. I'm holier than thou. You, you are still falling into sin after you got born again. Just be getting ready to go to hell. That the judgment of God is coming. So the heart of most Christians for their fellow Christians is not that they should be strengthened and restored when they fall. But they rather mock the ones that have fallen. They rather condemn the ones that have made mistakes. They wish that these ones that have made mistakes, you know, are disgraced openly, are laughed out, laughed at, and criticized and condemned. Now, but that is not the heart of God. Today, I'm going to show you the heart of God. And that is why I titled today's message, The God Who Leaves the 99. Now, why will that God leave the 99? And what is he going to do when he leaves the 99? So let's go to our Bible now and look at what God does when he leaves the 99. And why does he leave the 99? Let's, let's, go, let's start with Matthew chapter 18. Fortune, you're welcome. This is Mark Ryan, you're welcome. Yomi Jegede, you're welcome on the platform. Now, Matthew chapter 18, verse 12 to 14. Matthew 18, verse 12 to 14. Now, I have spoken with a lot of Christians. You know, I myself, you know, I was, I was once a youth president of a church. In fact, two different churches. I was a youth president and I was the choir director of those churches. So I, I have seen how church is done, you know, in Nigeria. Now, when I, when I, le when I left um, school, when I went to school, I was also in a fellowship called Castle, right? Now, so I've been, I've been in church. I've been in the Nigerian church, right? Now, I have seen how fellow Christians, I've seen their heart, the heart of fellow Christians. And now that I came to Ukraine, I still communicate with most Nigerian Christians. You know, I write a, a post on Facebook and people come there to comment. And people say a lot of things, you know, that I, be, I, I, be, I, be, I begin to wonder. Please share the video. You are, you are free to share, please. Fortune. You are free to, you are free to share the video. Now, I, I begin to wonder, do these people really know the heart of God? 
Why? Because all my years in church, I found out that when one believer is caught in a particular sin, or one believer is found doing one thing that is wrong, the desire of the rest people, their first instinct is not how to strengthen this brother and restore this brother. Their first, the first thing they do is let's condemn this brother. The first thing they do is to condemn. And that, that spirit of condemnation is born out of the, this holier-than-thou attitude. Thinking that, oh, because you commit, you sin differently from that guy's sin. Now, maybe that guy was caught in fornication or he was caught in adultery. But you, because you have not been caught in adultery or fornication, but you have your own sins, your own shortcomings, the sins of the heart, you have all of them. Now, the first thing people do is to say, okay, oh, this guy was caught. Let's stone him to death. The law of Moses said we should stone him, so let's stone him. So you see fellow Christians who are criticizing and condemning their, 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 their brothers instead of them to first of all look at the heart of God what will God do in this instance if God were to be in this church what will he do to this brother who has fallen now when I was in Abuja that was in 2012 now behind my church I saw a cattle rearer right with his cows now they were they were trying to move behind there's this um, ditch you know behind the behind a waterway behind the church and then uh, one of the one of the cow fell into that dish fell into that waterway now you know what happened the shepherd left every other cow and he was struggling doing everything to make sure he rescues this one that has fallen as I stood, I was watching like this, and God, you know what God told me? God said, Clem, this is how I relate with my people. This is how I relate with my children. You see what that shepherd is doing? That shepherd is doing everything possible to rescue that one that has fallen. He left every other one. He left all, 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 the, all the cows, not minding what is happening to them. He left them. But he went to do what? To rescue that one that has fallen. And God said, that is how I deal with my, my children. That is how I relate with my people. Now, what was the lesson for me? The lesson was that, listen, Clem, I know that my children still struggle with some sins. I know that my children still fall short. But whenever they are at their weakest states, whenever they have fallen, my desire for them is not to condemn them. My desire for them is not to punish them. My desire is not to send them to hell. My desire is not to judge them. But my desire is to rescue them. And I do everything possible to rescue them. I do everything possible to rescue them. From that day, I, I learned never to condemn anybody. I learned never to criticize any believer because of, of sin. I learned my lesson that day that instead of trying to be holier than thou, thinking that, oh, you, you are holy, that guy is still struggling with some sin, instead of doing that, I rather look for a way to help and rescue that brother, to rescue that sister, and to restore him back, and to pray for him. Why? Because that is the heart of the Father. Now, I've been talking. Let's look at scriptures now. Let's look at scriptures now. Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, verse 12 to 14. Now, I, I, I want to beg you to open your Bibles and read this story with me. I want to beg you. Now, if you catch what, I, what, we are, what I'm talking about today, if you understand what I'm going to be talking about today, your, you will, your Christian life will so change that you begin to see the way God sees. The intention of God will become your own intention. God's desire will, will become your own desires. Now, Look at it. Matthew 18, verse 12 to 14. Now listen to me. Look at what it says. This is Jesus speaking here. He said, What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, 
Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that has gone astray? Now listen to this. Listen to it again. What do you think Jesus said? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that has gone astray? That is why I titled my topic today, The God Who Leaves the 99. Now look at the next verse. If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which had not gone astray. If the shepherd finds that sheep that went astray, he rejoices over that one sheep that was found, over the 99 that didn't go astray. So it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. What is Jesus saying? That anyone who has become a child of God, who has come into the fold, it is not the will of God that such a one should perish. It does not matter the number of weaknesses and shortcomings that that person has. It doesn't matter the number of sins that believer still falls into. It doesn't matter the number of temptations and trials that overwhelm him. The Bible says that the shepherd leaves the 99 that are righteous. Leave the 99 that are holy. Leave the 99 that are not struggling with those weaknesses. And he leaves them on the mountain and goes to diligently seek for that one that has gone astray. Now, that is the heart of God. The heart of God is that that one that has gone astray, I am going to do everything possible to bring him back. I'm going to search the whole of the mountain. I'm going to go down the, the hills to go and look. I'm going to, I'm going to remove every obstacle to make sure that one that has gone astray, that one that is still battling with sin, that one that still has weaknesses and shortcomings, I am going to bring him back. I'm going to leave every other one that is holy, that is righteous, and I'm going to look for that one that has no fall, that, 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 that has fallen. Now, the Bible says when he goes and finds that one that has fallen, he will rejoice over that one more than he will rejoice about the 99 that had not fallen. So it means that if we are in church and we have 100 people in church and the remaining 99 are so holy and righteous, they pray all the time, they pay their tithe, they don't fall into any sin, no fornication, no adultery, no lies, you know, no anger, nothing, right? Now, the Bible says God leaves that 99 and looks for that one brother that one sister who is still struggling with fornication. He goes to look for that one brother who is still struggling with malice. He goes to look for that one brother who is still struggling with adultery. He goes to look for that one brother who is still telling lies. He goes to look for that one brother who is still gossiping and backbiting. He goes to look for that one brother who is still having hatred in his heart. Why? Because God places more value on that one soul that is going that is getting astray than he places on the remaining 99 now it means that god will do anything to bring back that one that is going astray to bring out that one that has gone astray now you know in our in our churches they they use the word backslide they say oh he has backsliding and their heart is not how to bring him back their heart is to go and gossip about him that he has backslidden. Their heart is to go and condemn him that he has backslidden. Their heart is to go and tell the world about his sins and his weaknesses. But the heart of the father is not to go and condemn him. The heart of the father is not to go and send him to hell. The heart of the father is not to, you know, judge him. The heart of the father is how can I rescue, how can I bring this one back? This is my son. 
This is my sheep that has gone astray. How can I bring him back? That is the heart of the father. And I want to ask you a question. Do you think that if God, you know, pushes the mountains away, pushes the hills and the valleys away, just to go and look for that one that is lost, do you think when he finds him, do you think he's going to accuse him of sin? Now listen. Do you think if God finds that one, he's going to accuse him of sin? Do you think God will do that? I want to, I, 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 listen, listen guys. I want to hear your response. The God who left the 99 to go and look for that one soul, do you think he's looking for that one soul to condemn him? Do you think he's looking for that one soul to send him to hell? Do you think he's looking for that one soul to punish him? Do you think he's looking for that one soul to kill him? Do you think he's looking for that one soul to bring condemnation to him? You think he did everything just to bring him, look for him, bring him, and then accuse him of sin? Is that, what do you think? Now listen, and why will God go in search, diligent search, ultimate search, for that one that is lost? Because of his love. Because of the love of God. Now, God is not even saying that this sheep, why did you go astray? Why did you go astray? After how many years you've, you've been a pastor, you've been a prayer warrior, you still went astray. No, God is not doing that. God is not doing that. God, when God, when God finds that one that went astray, he will not even mention sin to him. When God brings that one back, you know what God is going to do? God is going to throw a party. Heaven is going to rejoice over that one. So God will leave the 99 who are righteous and look for that one who has gone astray and look for that one who has fallen. But it is the pity that our churches today will not do everything to restore that one that has fallen. Our churches will not do everything to bring back that one into fellowship. You know what they will do? They will criticize him. They will condemn him. They will say he's going to hell. They will say he has lost his salvation. They will say all sorts of things about him. Just so that they themselves will feel good. That, oh, we, we are righteous. So, you know, we are not like that brother that is falling into sin. But that is not the heart of God. That is not the heart of God. The heart of God is that every one of my sheep will remain with me. That none will be lost. That is the heart of God. And that is why God is leaving the 99 to go and look for that one. Now, I want to speak to you today. If you are listening to me, I want you to begin to see the heart of God for his fold, for his sheep. Begin to see God's desire. God is not like us. Do you know, I was telling you yesterday that a woman was telling me you know, an advanced woman, she was telling me that if she has a son and the son keeps misbehaving, it will get to a time she will no longer love that son and she's going to disown the son. And this woman is a Christian. And I said, I, I said, I said to her, listen, if you are saying that you are going to disown your son and no longer love your son because your son keeps misbehaving, or keeps offending you, then you do not know the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father is such that his love, the boundaries of his love has no end. Paul said that you may know the length, the breadth, the height of the love of God, and to know the love of God that passes understanding. But because we do not know the love of God, we set out to condemn, we set out to judge, we, sent, we, 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 we go out to send people to hell and to condemn them to hell and to say, this one, has, this one is lost already. You know, this one is lost. We said it before that he had been committing that sin. We said it. He's lost. But the heart of God is that, listen, I know. I know all of your weaknesses. I know all of your shortcomings. I know. I knew you were going to fall into that sin. Even before you did it, I knew it. And I'm going to come looking for you. I'm going to restore you back. 
That is the heart of God. And if you are a Christian, and if that is not the heart you have, then you need to check your Christianity. If your heart is not such that you want to restore and strengthen and bring people back to fellowship, then you have not known God. If your desire is to go and be broadcasting people's sin and be condemning people to hell, if that is your heart, then you have not known God. You have not known him at all. Now, I want, I want, I want us to read this same, this same story in another, uh, in, in the book of Luke. Let's see the way Luke, Luke, Luke 15. Let's see the way Luke rendered it. Let's see the way Luke rendered it. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. So, the God who leaves the 99 to seek for that one that is lost will not accuse him of sin when he finds him. He will not condemn him when he finds him. He will not. He will not. He would rather rejoice and celebrate that I have found this one that was lost. And that should be the heart of every Christian. That should be the heart of every believer. Okay. Now, Luke chapter 15 from verse 1. Luke 15 from verse 1. Now, the task collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law murmured, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, who are the people that are murmuring? Who are the people that are murmuring? The Pharisees. The people who actually think that they are more righteous than every other person. And that is the spirit that, that, that leads to condemnation, that condemns people. That spirit of the Pharisee. That spirit that makes you think that you are better than every other person. That spirit that makes you think that you are holier than every other person. It is that same spirit that was upon the Pharisees that is upon most Christians today. That is what makes them condemn people. That is what makes them judge people. Because they think that they are better than every other person. They think that because they, their own sin is not very pronounced, that everybody knows about it, right? That because nobody knows about their sin, then they begin to feel self-righteous. And the one that has been caught, they say, let's stone him to death. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. It is the, it is the same spirit that the Pharisees had. And when they saw Jesus around the sinners, you know what they said? They said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, I want to ask you a question. If the man, Jesus, welcomes sinners, I mean, I'm talking about people who are not even born again. He welcomes them. He eats with them. If he welcomes sinners, what do you think he will do to his own children? What do you think he will do to those who have now accepted him as their Lord and Savior? And then they still fall into sin. What do you think he will do to them? He will abandon them because of their sin? He will send them to hell because they still fall into sin? No. Even the sinners who have not accepted him, Jesus welcomes them. His arms are open wide for all of them to come. Now, if anyone has come into his fold and that person still has one weakness or one shortcoming or still falls into one particular sin, he will not abandon him. He would rather do everything possible to restore him. That is the Jesus I know. That is the love of God I know. So if your Christianity does not teach you that, then you are just a Pharisee. You are just, you know, a self-righteous person, a religious person. You have not known the heart of God. Now, just the way the Pharisees are complaining that Jesus was eating with sinners, that is how most Christians are today. That this person, oh, you did this, you did this, you did that. They keep condemning people because of their shortcomings, because of their sins. They keep condemning people. But Jesus never did that. He never condemned anybody. Now, let's go ahead. Look at verse 3. This is Luke 15. Look at verse 3 now. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? He goes after the lost sheep until he finds it. He goes after the lost sheep until he finds it. In other words, he will not give up until he restores. He will not give up 
until he welcomes back. He will not give up until he reconciles that lost sheep. He's not giving up. Fellow believers can give up. Your pastors can give up on you. Your, even your, your fellow prayer partner can give up on you when you fall into sin. All of them can abandon you. And you have to be careful, guys. Now, there are people who are singing with you, worshiping with you today, in the same choir with you, in the same prayer unit with you. You think they love you. You think they, they care about you. It is when you are caught in sin, when you fall into sin, that is when you will know who truly loves you. That is when you will know who is truly born again, who truly knows the love of God. Why? Because when, when you are caught in your days of weaknesses, everybody will leave you. Everybody will desert you. They will go on social media and, and spread, you know, you know, that your sin and tell the whole world about your sin. They will go and report you to the pastor of the church. They will go and report you to the deacon of the church. And the next thing, the, their intention is not so that they will help you. The intention is so that, oh, pastor needs to hear about this, your sin. You must be suspended. You must be brought. So what do they do? They bring you the next day to the front of the church to shame you, to condemn you, to make you look as if you are the worst person on the earth. And the same people who are condemning you and stoning you and shaming you, they are even doing worse things than you, that, that, that you have done. But because you are the one that was caught, you know, they say, let's stone, let's stone him to death. Let's kill him now. But you know what the Bible said? The Bible said, God will go to any extent to look for that one that has sinned, to look for that one that has fallen. He will not give up until he finds him. He will not give up until he restores him. He will not give up until he strengthens him back. That is the heart of God. And if that is not the kind of Christianity that you are practicing, then you have not known God yet. You do not even know the love of God. You do not even know how much Jesus has forgiven you. You are thinking you are righteous. You are thinking you are, be, you are, you are doing some self-righteousness and some, some self-holiness. I pity you. You better start learning how to love people, even in their weaknesses. You better start learning how to go the extra mile to save people. And to strengthen them and to bring them back to fellowship, even in their worst, their worst states. That is the heart of God. And the Bible is telling us here that this shepherd will do everything possible. He will not stop looking for this lost sheep until he finds it. Until he finds it. Now watch. Now watch. He joyfully puts it on his shoulders. He joyfully puts this lost sheep on his shoulders. And goes home. Now watch. Then he calls his friends. He calls his friends and neighbors together. And says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Now look at this story very well. This shepherd never chastised the sheep. Oh, why did you get lost? Oh, why did you fall into that sin? Oh, you. A whole human of God, a whole you prayer warrior. Why did you do this? No, 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 no. The shepherd never even mentioned the sin of, of, the, of, of, of the sheep. The shepherd never even condemned the sheep at all. What did he do? When he found it, he carried it on his shoulders and brought him home and called friends. They come, let us celebrate. I have found my sheep that was lost. That is the heart of God. That is the God that leaves the 99 to go and look for the one. And that is the God I know. That is the God that I serve. And that heart of God has been reproduced in my own heart. That same love of God has been shed abroad in my heart. That is why you cannot see me condemning somebody because of sin. You will never see me condemn it. Oh, you, you committed this in the whole you. No, 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 I don't do that. I don't do that. I understand that all of us are still in flesh. I understand that all of us still have human nature. There is nobody who does not fall into sin. Your own may not be fornication. It may not be adultery. Your own may be hatred. Your own may be anger. Your own may be malice. Your own may be gossip. Your own may be, may be you know, backbiting. You know, all sort of, your own may be even anger. But everybody, because we are in flesh, we still fall. We still have weaknesses. So what do we do? Do we go about, you know, condemning our fellow brothers when they fall? No. What should we do? We should be like the shepherd who goes all the way, does everything to look for that one that has gone astray and bring him back without even mentioning his sin, without even criticizing him. That is the God that I know. 
that is the God that I know. Now, because it is that love, that same love that saved us while we were yet sinners. The Bible said, while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. While we were yet sinners, when we, we didn't even need him at all. We were, we, were, we, were, we were just living in sin. He still came, did everything, sent his son to the cross for us. So that his son will be crucified on our behalf to save us. Now, if he gave his son to die for us while we were yet sinners, now that we have become part of his family, now that we have become his children, is he going to send us to hell because we fall into one sin or the other? Is he going to condemn us and kill us because we fall into one sin or the other? No, he will not. He will not do that. He will not do that. The God I know is the God who will leave the 99 and go and diligently look for that one that, that is lost and restore him. He will not rest until he finds him. That is the God that I know. And if that is not the God that you know, then you are worshipping a different God. They are worshipping a different God entirely. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Now, verse 7, verse 7 says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who did not need to repent. You see, now, the beginning told us that Jesus was eating with sinners. So these are even people who are not even born again at all. The Bible says if he finds one, if he goes in search of one, and that one repents, he restores him. But he is the one who will go and look for that one. He is, see, you know, what we don't understand there, we are thinking that, oh, this person, you say you, 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 you fell into sin, won't you come back to God? Won't you come? No, no, no. The Bible says God is you. Is, look at the story. Who went, who went in search? Who went in search? It was the shepherd who went to search for the one that has fallen. God there did everything possible, explained to him, restored him in love, and brought him back. That is the God that I know. That is the God that I know. So if a sinner I'm talking about someone who is not born again at all. If any sinner, the Bible says, if one sinner repents, there is joy in heaven. Now, what about the person who is already born again, who is no longer a sinner, but still falls into sin? The Bible says, God will go and look for him and restore him and bring him back into his position without mentioning his sin, without criticizing him, without condemning him. He will restore him. That is the God. Now, let me show you again. Go to verse 8, verse 8 of that scripture, Luke 15, verse 8. There is another parable here that Jesus talked about, another parable that Jesus talked about. It is called the parable of the lost coin. The parable of the lost coin. Now, what did it say? Verse 8, Luke 15, verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Suppose a woman, right, has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Now look at what she's doing. First of all, she lights a lamp, she sweeps the house, and she searches carefully until she finds it. She will not relent, she will not stop until she finds it. That is the heart of God. He will do everything possible to make sure that all that he has, that none will be lost. I'm going to show you. God will make sure that everyone that has come into his fold, everyone that has received him as Lord and Savior, he will do everything possible that none of them will be lost. None. Now, what will he do? The Bible says he will light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, what will she do? She calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. What is the Bible saying? That God will go the extra mile, light the lamp, sweep the house, search everywhere, just to make sure that coin that was lost is found. But that is not what our Christians are doing today. Our Christians are looking, what? Listen to this. Our Christians are not looking for the lost coin or the lost sheep to restore him. They are looking for the lost coin or the lost sheep to condemn him. In fact, they are going to look for the sin. They are going to search for, your, for the sins of that lost one. They are not even looking for the person. They are looking for his sins so that they will publicize his sin and condemn him. 
I grew up in a church where, you know, deacons, you know, send people, send, they send spies to follow. When they see that maybe you are close to one sister, they'll start sending spies to look at you all around. What are they looking for? They are looking for sin. Now, why? Because they are looking for somebody that they will bring to the front to condemn. To say, oh, we caught this brother going to this sister's house. So they intentionally set trap for people just so that they will fall and then they can say, oh, we caught this one in sin. She has to be condemned. We're going to give her back seats or we're going to give him back seats. But that is not the heart of God. The heart of God is that the one who has fallen is restored, not to condemn him, not to condemn him. And until now, I want to beg us, we need to remove this holier than thou mentality from our head. Because the only thing that makes people condemn other people is holier than thou attitude. Is that self-righteousness? Because for you to be, for you to pick on somebody, right, and say, oh, this person is going to hell because he was caught in fornication, or this person is going to hell because he was caught drinking or you know caught fighting or something, right? For you to do that, it means for you to condemn that person to hell, it means that you have already judged yourself righteous and holier than that person. Because if you know that you yourself have shortcomings. If you know that it's only by the mercies of God that you are, you know, that we are not consumed. If you know that it is only by God's grace that you will enter that heaven, you will not even open your mouth to condemn another person for his sin. You will not do that. You will first of all look at yourself and say, God, if not for the cross, I know me, I have my own shortcomings too. My own shortcomings may not be loud, but the truth of the matter is all sins are sins. Whether it is anger or hatred or, or backbiting, whatever it is, all of us are guilty of sin. All of us. So you can't look at that person and magnify his own sin and say he's going to hell when you yourself have your own heart issues that you've not dealt with. There is hatred in your heart. There is bitterness in your heart. You've not dealt with it. So you should be looking at yourself to say, oh God, even for your mercies, and apply the same mercy to that person instead of going to condemn the person. So what God is doing in these parables, God never even, you know, criticized or condemned the, 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 the lost sheep or, you know, you know, criticized the, those, those who were lost. He rather did everything possible to bring them and to restore them. But we don't see that in our churches today. We don't see that in our churches. Now, my, my heart bleeds when I, whenever I chat with most, most Christians on Facebook and I chat with them. Before you say anything, they'll say, eh, hey, so because of grace, you are sinning, right? Because of grace, all of you are going to hell. I say, okay, let's even assume, eh, let's assume that because of grace, people are sinning. Let's just assume. Although it's not true anyway, but let's assume that people are sinning before, because of grace. Your fellow believers fall into sin because of grace. What should be your attitude? To restore them, to strengthen them, or to tell, to condemn them to hell? What should be your attitude? Your attitude should be to search for them, do everything possible to strengthen them, you know, widen their, their, their understanding and let them know that, okay, this thing you did, you should have done it like this, you know, and teach people not to condemn people. But it's a pity that the church of today is more of a condemning church. We are not preaching reconciliation. The Bible told us in 2 Corinthians that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. But the ministry we have today in our churches is the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of judgment. That is the ministry. And God has not given you that ministry. God only gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. He's not counting men's sins against them. And he has asked us to go and tell people that, listen, I'm no longer counting sin against people if they believe in me. So the ministry that has been given to us is the ministry of reconciliation, to reconcile and not to condemn and not to push away. Okay? Now, maybe you are listening to me and you are struggling with one particular sin or, or one weakness. And you are thinking that, oh, God is angry with me now. God is going to kill me right now. You know, God, I promise I won't do this again, but I still keep doing the same thing. And you are trying to run away from God. You are thinking that God, you know, is going to kill you. God is going to send you to hell. That God is angry with you now. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you know the heart of God, eh? if you know the heart of God, you will know that God himself is looking for you, 
not to come and condemn you, not to come and chastise you. He's looking for you to restore you. While you are running away from God because of your sin, God is looking for you. He's chasing after you. He's going through the mountains and the valleys just to look for you, to bring you back to himself. And when he finds you, if you will allow him to find you, if you will make yourself available and not keep running away from him, if he finds you, he will not even impute that sin into you. He will not even condemn you of that sin. He's not looking for you to judge you. He's not looking for you to condemn you. He's looking for you to restore you back to himself. Because he doesn't want to lose any one of you. He doesn't want to lose anyone that Jesus has already saved. God doesn't want to lose anyone. And so because he loves everybody and wants to, you know, make sure that his sheep is saved, he goes out to look for the lost sheep. So listen to me. Don't run away from God. Don't run away. He's looking for you to restore you. He's not coming to condemn you. He's not coming to kill you. No. He's coming to restore you. He's coming to strengthen you. He's coming to give you grace. He's coming to lift you up. That is the God that I know. That is the God that I know. So don't allow condemnation and guilt, you know. Don't allow the accuser of the brethren come and accuse you and try to push you away from God and make you think that, oh, now God is going to kill me. God is angry at me now. God cannot forgive me again. No, don't allow that. That is the, that is the deception of Satan to deceive people and to push them away from God. But God will do everything possible to look for you and to restore you. He will do everything possible to look for you and to restore you. Let me give you one more parable. Let me give you one more parable. Verse 11, the parable of the lost son. Now, after this parable, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to conclude. So what is our topic? The God who leaves the 99. Why is he leaving the 99? He's leaving the 99 to go look for that one that is lost, to go look for that one that still has shortcomings and weaknesses, to go look for that one that still falls into sin. That is the reason why he leaves the 99, to go and look for that one. And when he finds that one, he doesn't condemn him, he doesn't criticize him, he doesn't judge him, he rather restores him and throws the party to celebrate that this one has been restored. Now let's look at this last parable. Verse 11, Luke 15, Luke 15, verse 11, downward. Jesus continued, he said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off to a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Underline the word wild living. He went there, squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out of a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pawns, with the pot that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. When he came back to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. That is how most people do. When they fall short, they try to run away from God. They try to run away from God. They don't want to go back to God again. But this guy said, ah, he remember the love of God. He remember the abundance and the provision in his father's house. He said, I will set out and go back to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Now listen, this is the boy talking. He said, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, this is the boy because he was feeling condemned. He's not saying to himself, oh, I have sinned against you. You know, I've sinned against heaven. Make me as a servant. Make me as a servant. Now, what has he done? He has reduced himself to a servant because he is thinking that his father is angry with him. He is thinking that his father will kill him. He's thinking that his father will not even accept him. So he's not saying to himself, self-condemnation and self-guilt. His conscience had condemned him 
and made him feel guilty and now he's saying that father i want to i want to be like a servant take me as a servant again take me as a servant but what let's go ahead he said i am no longer worthy to be called your sons verse 20 so he got up and went to his father now watch but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and was filled with compassion <laughs> his father saw him and was filled with compassion his father saw him and was filled with compassion his father saw him and was filled with compassion with compassion his father saw him and was filled with compassion his father did not see him and was filled with anger his father did not see him and was filled with with raw rats his father did not see him and was furious no his father saw him from afar and was filled with compassion with compassion with compassion now watch he ran to his son who ran to who who ran to who the father ran to his son now for the father to run to the son that should tell you the heart of the father the father has been looking for a way for this son to come back if the father knew where the son was he would have gone to that country to bring him if the if the father knew exactly what country and what place the son was the father would have gone to look for him but because the father didn't know where the guy was the, but the father had been bothered and worried oh my son my son what is happening to my son now in that country where he is what is happening to him what is wrong with my son i believe the father must have spent sleepless nights just thinking of how i can go and bring back this my son how i can bring back this son that i love so much how i can bring back this son you know that I, this my my son that i i want to restore the father must have been thinking of how he can go and bring back the son but because he didn't know where the son was he couldn't go and look for the son and so when he saw the son from afar coming his compassion rose that is the heart of God that is the compassion that is the love of God his mercies are new every morning his love never fails nothing can separate us from his love so when he saw the son the Bible says his compassion he was filled with compassion for him and he was the one that ran towards the son you see he ran towards the son why was he running towards the son to restore him to love on him again to provide for him again to shelter him again to restore him again to reconcile him again now let's go ahead let's go ahead now not only that he ran to him you know what he did he threw his arms around him and kissed him. Oh my God. You mean somebody who took your money and your property and went to squander it to live a wild life, to live with prostitutes in another country. He's coming back and you are running to him to embrace him and to throw your hand around him and kiss him. You are not even, you are not even scolding him. You! A who you? Why did you take my money and went to squander it in another land? Well, no, no, he didn't do that. He threw his arms around him. He threw his arms around him and loved on him and kissed him. He did not even mention his sin. He did not even mention anything the boy did wrong at all. He threw his hand around him. He ran, he ran to him. He ran to him. He ran to him out of compassion and out of love. That is how we should treat fellow christians that is how we should see people we should we should we should we should begin to demonstrate that love of god that no matter the shortcoming of that person no matter the offense the person has committed against you you should be the one going to seek him to restore him you should be the one running to that person to love on him again to restore him again and not to criticize him and not to condemn him and not to so let's stone let's stone her the law of moses said we should stone her today no 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 god moved with compassion to go and run to this son loved on him and kissed him and kissed him let's go ahead let's go ahead now look at look at the next thing look at the next thing the son said to him father i have sinned against heaven and against you now listen to this listen now i want, I want to ask you a question the kissing when the father ran to the son and kissed the son right 
The father ran to the son and kissed him and threw his arms around him. Has the son already apologized to the father before the father did that? Now, if you are following me, I want, I want you guys to, to respond. The Bible said, the father saw him from afar off and ran to him, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Has the boy said anything to the father yet? Has the boy confessed his sins yet? Has the boy even asked for forgiveness yet? No. But the love of the father came first. The love of the father was still shown and expressed. Why? Because the father was not even angry with the boy. The father was not even going to condemn the boy. He was not even going to mention the boy's sins to him. All he was looking for was just, I need my son. This is my son. I want, I want to restore him back. I love him so much. I can't allow him to waste away in another country. I just want to restore him. That is the father's heart. Now, because some people will say, oh, eh, you, you did not repent of your sin. You did not ask for forgiveness. You, 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 now God is angry with you. God is going to kill you. No. The story here, before the boy even opened his mouth to say, Father, I have sinned against you, the father has already demonstrated that he was not angry with the boy. He has already demonstrated, you know, that, listen, I've been looking for a way to restore your sins. I wish I knew where you were, where you were. I would have come to look for you and restore you. And so he kissed him and loved on him. So it is not because the boy asked for forgiveness, no. Now, somebody is saying in that comment session, is it vital to ask for forgiveness and to repent? Of course, why not? You, you should, you should. But I'm telling you that it is not that asking for forgiveness and that repentance that make the father loves you more, that even make the father forgive you. If you look at this story, you will know that the father has already forgiven the boy, even before the boy came to open his mouth to say anything. The father has already longed for him to come so that he would fellowship with him again. He will restore him again. Now, he is coming with a servant mentality. He is coming with, 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 with a servant mentality that I want to be your servant. But the father's heart is not to reduce his son to a servant because of sin. No. The father's heart is not to, refuse, to, re, to reduce the boy to a slave because of sin. No. The father's heart. I'm going to show you the father's heart. I'm going to show you the father's heart here. But the boy, because of condemnation and guilt, he wants to assume the, the position of a slave. Now look at what he said. Look at what he said. He said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You see? Now what is that? That is self-condemnation. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That is guilt. That is conscience destroying him right there. And I told you, I did a video uh, with Pastor Neuron on Saturday that is titled Overcoming Sin Consciousness. Please go and look for that video. Go and look for that video. I, I talked about the conscience, what the conscience does to us and why the conscience is dangerous. I, I did that video. You need to go and look for that video. So this guy, his conscience has condemned him, right? So he's not saying to, the, to his father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But let's see what the father said. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe. What? They bring the best robe for somebody who went to squander your money to live a wild life, for somebody who went to sleep with prostitutes, bring the best robe. No, you can't do that. But you know what? That is the heart of God. In the eyes of the father, that boy cannot become a slave. The father is not even imputing the sin of that boy against him. The father is not even criticizing him and condemning him. The guy wants to be a slave because his conscience is condemning him. But the father's heart is that, listen, you are a king. You are a prince. Even though you messed up and you, and you, and you, and, and, and you fell short, I cannot reduce you to a slave. I cannot. My nature will not allow me. My love will not allow me to separate you from me and make you a slave. No. I know that you did this thing, but I'm not, even, I'm not even charging it against you. I'm not even condemning you. So if you want to be a slave, it is because your conscience is destroying you. But the heart of the Father keeps loving. He loves us through thick and thin. He loves us through thick and thin. And nothing can separate us from Him. You know, there's there this song that, 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 that said by Jesus Culture. Nothing can separate even if I run away, your love never fails. 
I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. Now, that is the love of God. Even if we are running away, His love is chasing after us, looking for us to restore us. Even though we make mistakes, His love never reduces. That is the love of God. Now, let's, let's round up this story now. You see, the father said, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring in his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine, he didn't say this servant, he said this son of mine was dead and is alive again. So the heart of the father is to, is to rejoice that the son is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Did you see? The father never mentioned his sin. The father never criticized him. He never condemned him. He gave him a position that is meant for prince. The best robe. Put a finger and put a crown on him. Wow. That is the heart of God. Now, is God, is God happy that, the, that we fall into sin? No. Is the father rejoicing that the, father, that the, the guy messed up? No. But his love never diminished. His love for that son never diminished. And his desire is to restore him. And that is how every one of us should live. Now, but see where the problem is. See where the problem is now. Verse 25. Look at where the problem is. The problem is with our fellow Christians, our fellow brothers. That's where the problem is. I told you that God is not condemning any, any believer, any son, because of sin. He's not sending anybody to any believer to hell because of sin. Now, is sin bad? Yes. But is God going to send believers to hell because they fall into sin? No. Now, look at, but who, who, who is it that condemns? Who condemns the believers? Who accuses the believers? Fellow believers. You will see it here. Now watch. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. They told him, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the, fat, the fattest calf because he had, he had him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry. Did you see that? The older brother became angry that the one that was lost had been found. The older brother became angry that the one that went astray was restored by the father. The older brother got angry that his father is throwing a party for his younger brother. And that is how church people... You know, I was surprised that I was chatting with people on Facebook. Eh? And Christians, fellow Christians, they are angry to hear about grace. They are angry to hear about forgiveness. I preach a message about, you know, God forgiving you all your sins. Right? I preach a message about the grace of God and people come and they start attacking me and they begin to say, oh, if you are a believer and you fall into sin, you know, do, 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 grace will not save you, God will not forgive you. And I'm, I'm like, look at these guys. Oh. Are you people not supposed to be rejoicing that God is forgiving people their sin? Are you not supposed to be rejoicing that God is saving people? They say, no, you deserve, you, they, 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 they are falling into sin, they have to go to hell, they have to go to hell. They are preparing themselves for hell. The same mentality that this brother has. They are, he's not happy that his brother has been restored. He's not happy that his father restored the brother. He's not happy. He's angry. And that is how most Christians are. When God is forgiving people their sin, some Christians say, no, why would God forgive him? He must face judgment. He must be punished for his sins. The same thing Jonah did. God sent Jonah to Nineveh to go and preach. And Jonah refused to go. Finally, God had to force him to go. He went to Nineveh. God preached to the people of Nineveh. And all of them repented. And God saved, saved them and did not destroy them again. The next thing that happened, Jonah got angry. That God, I said it before that you will forgive them their sin. I said it that you will forgive them. I know you are a merciful God. This was what I was saying. That you will, you will not punish them again. You know what he said? He said, God, take my life. Jonah said God should kill him. Why? Because God gave forgiveness to a whole city. Called Nineveh. Jonah was the prophet to the man of God. 
He got angry that God forgave Nineveh. And he said God should kill him. The same thing with this brother here. He got angry that his brother who fell into sin was restored. And that is why I see, what, what I see most Christians do today. They are angry when God forgives. They are like the Pharisees. They would rather that that Christian is condemned to hell. They would rather that that person is suspended and punished. They would rather throw stones at that person that has fallen. And so when they see God forgiving people, they get angry. They say, oh, after everything he did, God still forgive him. Eh? God still forgive him. You don't know God. You're not even born again. If your mentality is like that, you, don't, you are not even born again at all. You don't even know what, what the heart of the Father is. Because if you know the heart of the Father, you should be rejoicing that this one that was lost has been restored. But if you are not rejoicing that this one has been restored, you are rather looking for a way to condemn him and to tell the whole world about his sin, then you don't know God. You are just professing to be a Christian. You don't know God at all. You don't know what love is. You don't know what mercy is. You don't know what grace is. You don't. Now look at what the guy said. He said the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. I love this father. This father is so loving. The father went to plead with him. The father is like the king. He's going to plead with this other son that is angry. This one that misbehaved, he did not even chastise him. He didn't even condemn him. Threw a party for him. This one that is getting angry. He didn't even get angry at him. He went to plead with him. That is God. That is God. What God wants is reconciliation. Reconciliation. He wants peace with us. That's what he wants. That is heart. To be at peace with us. That's the heart of God. Okay? Now, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Did you see? Did you see self-righteousness? All these years I have never broken any of your commandments. I've been working for you all these years. Yet, you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. You see where his priority is. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, did you see that? The brother is the one who is even outlining the sin of the, of the younger brother. He said, this is your son who has squandered your property with prostitutes. You see, he's already condemning the boy. But the father never condemned the boy. But this elder brother now is the one condemning. That is how most of our Christians are today. They are the ones condemning their fellow Christians, criticizing their fellow brothers, sending them to hell, condemning them because of sin. Right? Now watch. It said, you kill the fattened calf for him. You kill the fattened calf for him. You say, but my, the father said, my son, you are always with me. You are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. So that is the heart of the father. That is the heart of the father. He never condemns anybody. He never judges anyone that is born again. He doesn't condemn them to hell. What he does when they fall into sin, he goes the extra mile, puts in the extra effort. To restore them so that is the God that leaves the 99 to go and look for that one that is lost in that story you just finished reading now the father never opened his mouth to ask the boy why did you go and spend your money with prostitutes no why did you squander your money he didn't even ask him he didn't even ask him what he did the boy was the one who was explaining what he did. the father did not even ask him and the father did not even listen to him while he was talking but I said, please, go and bring, call the servant. Let's throw a party for him. That is the heart of God. So what should you do? Why am I preaching this message to you? I'm telling you that you need to understand the love of God. You need to know the heart of God. The heart of God is not that anybody should perish. God does not rejoice over people when they fall into sin. He does not rejoice when people are sent to hell. No, he does not rejoice. His desire is that all be restored. That is his heart. And because of that, his heart... He does everything to restore the one that has fallen. He doesn't condemn. He doesn't condemn. What he does is to show compassion and love. His arms are wide open to anyone. And he will go the extra mile to go and look for them and embrace them and bring them back to himself. 
So one thing I know I, I want you to learn today. Don't you ever condemn people for their sins. Don't you. Now, even if they are not born again, don't condemn them. Why? Because that person you are seeing today that is a sinner, tomorrow will be a saint. God is going to save him. So don't even condemn them. Don't condemn them. Now, what about those who are born again, who are already part of the family? Don't dare. Don't dare condemn them. What should you do? You should try and reconcile them. You should pray for them. You should try and strengthen them. Your prayer should be, God, this brother is falling into this sin. This brother has this weakness. God, please restore him. God, please strengthen him. Now, that should be your desire. That should be your heart. Then, if you are the one who is in that sin, right, I want you to know, don't run away from God. Don't say, oh, God is angry with me. Now, God is going to kill me. No, 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 no. Don't even, you know, cultivate the servant mentality like that son. No. Know that your father still loves you. Now, the truth of the matter is everybody who falls into sin, every believer who falls into sin, feels that remorse on the inside. And because of that remorse, because he feels that I've, I've offended God, he, he tries to run away from God. He thinks that God is angry with him. But listen, God is not angry with you. God wants to restore you. He wants to reconcile you back to himself. So what should you do? Go back to God. He's looking for you. He wants to restore you. He's not going to condemn you. He will never even mention your sin. He will not mention your sin at all. He's looking for you to bring you back. You remember the story I told you at the beginning about the, the cattle rearer and that cattle, that cow that fell? He left every other one and did everything possible to rescue that one that has fallen. Remember the, the lost sheep, the shepherd, you know, left the mountain, looked for the hills everywhere in search of that one that has fallen. That is what God does for every believer who falls into sin. God goes in search of them. God goes in search of them. Even when you are running away, thinking that God is going to kill you now, God is going to send you to hell now. No, the heart of God is full of love and compassion. His mercy endures forever. He will not always get angry with us. No, he will not. He will not. He will not. He's full of compassion. What does he do? He shows us his mercy and he will do everything to make sure that you are restored to him. So don't be too, don't, don't be too quick, guys. Don't be too quick. Don't be too quick to, don't, 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 don't be too quick to write people off. Don't be too quick to say, oh, this one is lost already. Don't be too quick to label people and say, oh, this one has backsliding. Or this one is a bad person. Or this one is a sinner or is a pretender. No, don't be too quick. Don't be too quick. Everybody that, you know, is struggling with sin, right, truly wants to return to God. They truly want to return to God. But because of the heart of condemnation and the guilt, and because Satan keeps on accusing them, they tend to run away from God, thinking that God is angry at them. But with the stories you saw today, God is not angry at them. God is not. God is rather leaving the 99 and doing everything to go back in search, to look for that one that is lost. That is the heart of God. And that is how every one of us should treat people. Treat people as though you are God. Treat people as though you understand the love of God. That when they fall, you don't criticize them. You don't condemn them. What do you do? You look for a way to restore them. You look for a way to restore them. Okay? I hope that I was able to deliver the message and the message made sense to you. I hope I was able to do justice to the message. But don't forget, I said this, I'm doing a series. And the series is titled, The God Who Lives in 99. Today is just the, the first video. So I'm going to come again, you know, probably tomorrow. And I'll do a part two of about the God who leaves the 99 and I'm going to show you why God leaves the 99 to go and search for that one that has fallen. If you are blessed, please why not share the video and invite your friends to watch it later, copy the link, put on their inboxes and let them watch the video. And if this video has touched you and blessed you in any way, please apply what has been taught, the love of God, the love of God, the love of God that surpasses all understanding. Never to condemn people, right? But to reconcile and to accept people because, you know, that is the heart of God. 
Thank you, Mr. Yomin Jegede. You said you have shared the video already. I will, not, I will not have the time to read all of your comments, but I appreciate the comments. I'm going to read them later on. And if there is any question there, I'm going to um, attend to it tomorrow. When I come live tomorrow, the first thing I will do is to respond to any question that, that is on the, on, on the comment session. So thank you for sharing the video. Thank you for your questions and thank you for your comments. I love you all. God bless you. Do have a good night rest. Bye for now.